Um, who has ever uh, thought about uh, the topic of brain and consciousness? Anybody has ever done it here? Some few, okay, great. Uh, they, okay, that, that's good to know. So uh, for me, because uh, Tito asked me to give a, a brief uh, vita, for me it was before I went to graduate school, I was actually uh, at the end of high school considering to go to medical school, like uh, a lot of you might have at some point, and wasn't entirely sure. I worked for a year in a hospital and that, that uh, showed me that that's not the right path to go for me. And so I was a little bit at a loss what I want to do. And uh, I decided to take a trip with my friends. And at the airport, I uh, realized that they will all go to the beach and I can't because of my uh, very light skin. I always have to sit in the shade. So I should get a book that I can read while they um, hang out in the sun. And I picked uh, a book at the airport that sounded interesting. And it said, uh, The Scientific Search for the Soul. And I read the book on the, on the flight and I didn't basically put it down until I got back from the trip and then I knew what I wanted to do. So uh, today I will talk about uh, a little bit basically what the book was about and uh, why I got interested in that. And then also uh, what has happened ever since. And then um, maybe a tiny bit of a contribution that, that uh, my group had for this as well. So what is the topic about you know, consciousness? Well, the interesting thing about uh, our being is that we're not like a stone, we're not like a table, we're not like a pen. Uh, when you opened your eyes this morning, this happened. So the world became something for you. You started experiencing things. You might have had pain, you might have had joy, you might have had dread to come here. Uh, you saw things, you heard things, you, you smelled yourself uh, until maybe you started brushing your teeth. And so we don't think that a table or a stone has that property. They just seem to exist in the world, but the world doesn't exist for them. And that is really interesting and peculiar. And we do think as neuroscientists, of course, that that has something to do with the brain. In fact, most of us probably would say that there's a causal link from brain activity to this fact that we can have this conscious subjective experience. And if there's a causal link, and if we're scientists, and if the brain is part of the universe that we as scientists can understand, then we should be able to do this. We should be able to explain the fact that we have conscious experience, that the world is something to us, with the tools of science in terms of brain activity. And that is a process we call reducibility. So to give you an example, um, not too long ago, 80 years ago or so, people thought that there's something similar, miraculous, about the fact that you are alive. And someday you won't. But at some point you became. And if you think about the things that are alive, there seems to be an unbroken chain. You take things that are alive and they produce things that then are alive. But you won't have a stone or a table or anything that isn't alive, all of a sudden become alive. So Frankenstein is still a work of fiction. That, at that point, two people said that if you can reduce life to physics, chemistry, everything that we know in science, that would be miraculous. We don't believe you can. In fact, they hypothesized that everything that is living is living due to something that's immaterial, supernatural, if you will, and they call it the elan the, uh, vital, the spirit of life. And that is why you can't take dead matter and turn it into living matter. It lacks the spirit of life. And only if you have the spirit of life, you can give it on to the next generation of spirit of life. Well, we don't believe that anymore. And we don't believe that anymore, largely because of a group of scientists that found out what the structure of DNA is and how inheritance works. And so for us, life is reducible now to chemistry. A lot of you guys have learned organic chemistry, molecular biology, there's nothing more miraculous. But this right here I will talk about today hasn't happened yet. In fact, that is a big question in neuroscience. If it is possible to reduce phenomenal subjective experience to brain activity, yes or no. And if so, we should be able to look at brain activity and derive the conscious state of somebody that, ha that has uh, the brain ex experiencing. And there are people that are very skeptical that this will ever be possible. And for that reason has been coined by one uh, uh, philosopher, an Australian philosopher who's still with us, the hard problem. It seems to be a very hard problem for us neuroscientists to do. Now, at this point, you might feel that sounds interesting, or you might feel, why care? And so what? Well, I want to convince you that this is really important because we can't look at a brain and derive whether the uh, person or the animal that has the brain is conscious or not. There's a whole bunch of problems that arise from that and some of them you might care a lot about. So for example, 
We do not know how, and sometimes we do not know if general anesthesia works. So what I mean by that is that if you need major surgery, we're gonna take off some of your limbs, we're gonna take out of your appendix, and we're gonna put you under. So we're, uh, we're promising you that you're unconscious, and you're not gonna experience the pain that goes with that. We're not sure that that is actually happening because what goes with anesthesia is also retrograde amnesia. In other words, you will forget what happened during anesthesia. Sometimes you get even drugs to do that. And there are tests where, you, uh, where uh, people have been studied, uh, studying whether people are really unconscious during anesthesia and certainly not everybody always is. And as, as an anesthesiologist, there's nothing you can do about that because you can't look at the brain and derive whether, there's conscious, whether the lights are on or off. So that's a problem. The next one is people in coma. So the last 10 years or so, we learned that many people that we think are in coma and therefore unconscious, some of them aren't. So what people have done is they put people in an fMRI machine and they said, said think of a face. And then you saw activity in the face area. Think of a house, you saw activity in the house area. I'm gonna give you a bunch of names. When I say your name, think of a face. And exactly when that name was named, the face area lights up again. So we started to be able to communicate with people that we thought were unconscious. We start to worry now about people that might also be deaf and they just can't hear us. So here's another problem. Of course, we don't know even when in development uh, you have developed consciousness. When does that really start? Um, and then there's maybe the, some more poetic sense that uh, we don't know what it is like to be somebody else or something else that is a famous philosophical problem. We don't know which animals are conscious or not. And, and this will become a more pressing topic, we don't know if artificial intelligence is conscious, will ever be conscious, and when this will happen. So each time that you run machine learning on your computer, or you, you get one of these maybe new robots and you turn them off, are you killing a conscious being? Are you turning off a soul? So these are ethical considerations that stem from the problem that we can't answer what I just said. And that's not even all. The one that I find even more disconcerting is that if we accept that as neuroscientists, we cannot explain how consciousness arrives by neural activity, we are making a huge gap right in the middle of science and are saying, you can't touch this. Science can't touch this. Science will never be able to answer that. Now, science, though, most of us feel should be able to explain everything. In fact, we've taken on worldviews and thrown out other worldviews by saying that this, what you explained before, now science can explain. Well, I'm telling you that there's a big thing in the middle of science, and it's your existence. The only thing that you're absolutely certain of, that you right now are conscious. We can't explain that. So that's disconcerting a scientist. And there's a lot that follows from that as well. Are there other things that science can't explain? How can it be that the one thing that you are most certain of, the fact that you are conscious right now, you might wake up in a second and, and realize this was just a dream. All of this here was wrong. The wrong assumption, but you were conscious, you knew that. So the thing that you're most certain of seems to be the least explainable in terms of science. That's troubling. And then of course it means that we can't trust science itself because science is based on you experiencing and thinking, taking in this information, trusting some things that others don't. So this is a big topic, it's an important topic. And there's not a whole lot of work on it. The work that we have has led to consensus, and this is one of the, the ways that we think of consensus, which is that consciousness is complex. There's at least two dimensions to consciousness. One is what I will call a level of consciousness, how much consciousness there is, and then the other one uh, would be the content of consciousness, or so in this case here, the, the axis are flipped. And why do we think that we can have this two-dimensional space? Well, if you take different states of consciousness and you order them by how much people seem to uh, have arousal or level of consciousness and how much content we believe there is in our con con uh, consciousness, we can order them in this two-dimensional space, suggesting that these two axes are orthogonal. That means that things can vary independently from each other within uh, these two dimensions. So here are these different states. And you can already uh, see some that I talked about. Uh, coma and general anesthesia, we think that there's not a whole lot of content in your consciousness if things go well. Deep sleep, of course, might be a little bit above, it might be right here, but REM sleep, we think 
even though you're in the exact same uh, level of consciousness, there's the same level of arousal, now there's more content. So you can see how that pops up right here. And in lucid dreaming, uh, the fact that you become aware of what you dream and you can maybe even consciously uh, influence what you're dreaming might be even higher in terms of the contents of your consciousness. And then there's these very interesting states right here where it seems that uh, we have people, uh, patients in coma, and their level of consciousness is high. So they wake up in the morning, they open their eyes, they might even smile at some points, but it seems that the lights are out. They don't seem to have any conscious experience. Uh, the fact that uh, what I just told you that we can communicate with some of these patients that moves them out of this uh, uh, description of coma into this description of coma. So we believe that now there's a little bit more contents going on. Now, uh, intuitively though, we feel that most of uh, the states that we experience on a daily basis, they correlate. So as we become more aroused, um, uh, there also seems to be, a, be more content of consciousness. And so typically we vary a little bit in contents and awareness. So if I wake you up, now your level is higher and you might for a moment experience more information. Now the interesting case for uh, studying consciousness in the brain is right here, where I hope you are. So you're really aroused, really alert, attentive, and you're experiencing a lot. Even in this case, uh, the intuition of what we can experience uh, lets us astray very often. So uh, some of you might have seen this illusion before. If not, uh, please just fixate. So keep your eyes steady on the spot right here. Don't move them while I keep talking. And as you keep your eyes steady, what you should experience is that <clears throat> the gap that moves around, one blue dot that is removed at a time, uh, isn't the only effect anymore that you see. In fact, all of a sudden you see some of the other blue dots uh, disappear from view as well. And eventually, instead of just seeing a gap in the blue dots, you see a yellow spot that moves around, bright yellow. And so uh, if you move your eyes, you can convince yourself that all of that just happened in your mind. None of that is really on the screen. So what I'm just showing you here is that even if you're fully conscious, fully high level, fully content, you fail to see some things that are actually on the screen. So in this case, some of the other blue stimuli when they disappeared, and you can start to hallucinate and see things that don't really exist, uh, such as that yellow spot. So what that means in terms of this diagram is that even right here, we are reaching a state that is necessary, but not sufficient for you to reach consciousness. Why is that important? Well, that allows us to look into the brain and maybe make some headway in terms of what is going on. And so the first proposal in terms of how to uh, scientifically get at that was, to look at the neuronal correlates of consciousness. And it's exactly what it sounds like. So the idea is that whenever you're experiencing some stimuli, such as the illusion that you just saw, there's neural activity in your brain evoked by these stimuli. And a lot of this neural activity is just housekeeping. It is uh, going on in, in your brain right now, making sure that uh, you are keeping the temperature despite you got wet. So uh, the blood vessels have to open and close. Uh, you might get thirsty, hungry. All of these things are going on in the background. You're not consciously aware of any of those. In fact, if I tell you that you can feel your clothing on your skin, now you can just a moment before you didn't. So a lot of the activity in your brain doesn't translate to consciousness, but hearing me, that is what enters your consciousness. So there seems to be a certain part of neural activity that's privileged. It has access to your soul, if you will. Whatever that does is what you experience. And that's uh, what we're trying to get after. Now, before I show you some of the data, I have to give you a brief background, uh, just literally a slide or two in terms of the makeup of the brain. A lot of these experiments have done in the visual system, so this is gonna be a crash course of what we know about the visual brain. So our eyes, of course, are taking in photons, and that is the starting point of visual information. The eyes um, are very poorly designed in that they have blood vessels run in front of the photoreceptors. So the actual image that arrives in the back of your eye is actually obstructed, at least partly, by blood vessels that run in front. If we had more time, I could give you an experiment so you can visualize your own blood vessels uh, under certain circumstances. You can see them. Most of the time, your brain just erases them from view. Also, because of uh, the lens being a very simple lens in front of your eye, the image is flipped. Because your eye is round, the image gets distorted. And of course, there's no such thing as color out in the real world. So this would be the input to your brain. So what happens next? Well, we think that there's a cascade of processing that I'm showing you right here. And you can see these different arrows in yellow. So basically, the information uh, enters the back of your brain. It gets sent from the eyes to the back of your brain. And from there, it moves back on forward in a giant wave of activation. And um, I'm also showing you right here in this diagram 
the average time if you're recording neurons uh, at which these neurons respond in those areas. So you can see that there's a huge overlap, but by and large you can see that it seems to go from here to over here. And in gray, you can see the area, in this case would be the area on the screen because it translates to an area in the back of your eye where these neurons get inputs from, where they get excited from, we call it the receptive field. So uh, the, the only Nobel Prize ever that was given in systems neuroscience uh, was to Hubel and Wiesel back in the 1980s for finding out these properties that I just talked about. That these neurons in the back of your eye, they only respond to a limited amount of space. And we've done a lot of work since, moving uh, throughout the brain forward. And what we found is that not only do these neurons respond later and later, not only do they have access to larger and larger parts of view, but they also respond to more and more complex patterns of visual activation. And once you reach um, the, the anterior most part um, of the visual system, you actually get responses to faces and objects and their like. So uh, psychologically, we believe that something like this is going on, that the visual system is taking light patterns in the back of your eye, and it analyzes them in terms of a mosaic, where each neuron only knows a very little bit about a tiny amount of space. And then in this sweet, uh, sweeping wave that moves forward in the visual system, piece by piece, the visual system reconstructs the actual image. And in doing so, it makes assumptions. That is why that illusion that I just showed you worked. Sometimes these assumptions are wrong, and then your perception ends up being something different than what I've been showing you. Does that all make sense? Any questions so far? Okay. So, here's the big surprise. This right here is Francis Crick. He is the person that I mentioned at the outset of this talk, a co-discoverer of the double helix structure of DNA. He also went on to decipher most of the genetic code that we know today, which three uh, which three nucleotides translate into which amino acid. And then he got bored. He literally told people, I went and tried to find out what the, double, of what the structure of DNA is because I wanted to get away from the idea that life is something we can't explain scientifically. And I've done that. He literally said, I solved the problem of life. Now I want to solve the problem of the soul. So he quit. All work in molecular biology and, and he became a neuroscientist. This right here is a young Christoph Koch. So, uh, uh, Francis teamed up with Christoph, and they basically pushed, by the sheer power of will, the field of consciousness neuroscience into being. Christoph, uh, Francis unfortunately passed away a couple of years ago. Christoph is still with us. He is the head of the Allen Brain Institute. If you haven't heard about this yet, it's one of the biggest private institutions that we have today that does neuroscience work, founded by Paul Allen, the co-founder of Microsoft. Back then, though, they had a problem. They had to convince their colleagues that you can study consciousness. And we went through, in science, uh, we went through a long time of not touching anything that would be related to consciousness. There was a period we called behaviorism, where we stuck to just studying behavior. And, and you might still find remnants of that mindset today, that some people believe that all we can measure in science is behavior. Well, they tried to find a way out. So what they did is they published a paper in Nature. And the paper in Nature just made a claim, or it proposed a question, and it said, are we aware of neural activity in primary visual cortex? Now, the primary visual cortex is the first part of the brain that I just told you about in the back of the head that receives the information of the eyes. What a weird question to ask. Why does this question make sense? Well, if I ask you, do you need your eyes to be able to see? Your first reaction might be yes. If I close my eyes, I'm blind. Or if I take my eyes out, I'm blind. But then think about what happened last night. You had your eyes closed, and you might have still experienced something. You might have seen something because we call it dreaming. You don't need your eyes to see anything. You can close your eyes right now, and then I say, Brad Pitt, and you can see something right in front of you. You don't need your eyes to see. So what part of the brain do you need to see? Well, the logic of Christoph and Francis was, let's step through the brain, and for each area, we ask, do, you, do I need you or not? Can I take you out and still be able to dream? And in fact, there are patients that lack a primary visual cortex, and they'd say they can still dream. So do we need the primary visual cortex, yes or no? The, uh, the basic premise was that the diagram that I just said is that the inf information from the eyes flows from the retina to the primary visual cortex, which is often abbreviated as V1, and then this cascade happens. And their main argument was there is no feedback from the prefrontal cortex all the way to the back of the brain, and since they believed that feedback is necessary for consciousness, there can be no consciousness right here. Consciousness arises right there. So if we're asking where's the neural correlate of consciousness, we should not find anything here, but we should find it there. So we can split 
the brain activity, as I just said before, into brain activity that you're unaware of, that has no relationship to your consciousness, no privileged access to your soul, and then this brain activity right here, which is probably directly causing the subjective experience that you have. How can you study that? Well, you use visual illusions. So here's another one that I like a lot and has been used a lot <clears throat> by colleagues of mine and myself. Uh, again, fixate on the, the red dot right here and don't move your eyes, but what, watch what happens to the red dots up there. So if you don't move your eyes and you look at this very quickly, these red dots up there should disappear and then they reappear and they disappear and they reappear. So that's an interesting stimulus for us because it means in terms of physics, as a function of time, there's no change. If you keep your eyes really still, the input to your brain is 100% exactly the same as a function of time, but your perception, your consciousness, it goes on, off, on, off, on, off, on, off. So now an easy thing to do is we look into the brain and we look at, is their brain activity looking like this or like that? So if we find brain activity that is constant and unchanging, well, that must be that unaware brain activity we're talking about. That is reflecting the world as it is and has nothing to do with your consciousness. And we find brain activity that is doing this on, off, on, off, in sync with you seeing things on or off. That should be brain activity that has something to do with consciousness. Does it make sense? Okay, that was the logic back then. Now, a lot of these experiments were done a long time ago uh, by uh, a former colleague of ours, uh, Jeff Schall, who was here at Vanderbilt. Uh, this is my PhD advisor, Nikos Logothetis. They teamed up and they wrote the first paper ever that was titled Neural Correlates of Subjective Visual Experience and uh, non-surprisingly got published in Science. So what did they do? Well, they recorded single neurons and looked at the activity of these neurons uh, doing this illusion. And so what they did is they uh, trained the animal to report whether the red dot was present, yes or no. And you can just do this with operand conditioning. And you can see right here that uh, there was a left lever and a right lever. And what you can see whenever uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, the lever that corresponds to seeing something, the right lever was pulled, these neurons seem to respond more or less. So uh, this right here is David Leopold, uh, who was uh, my mentor during my PhD and also during my postdoc. These are data from his PhD thesis that uh, he published in Nature in 1999. And all this, this does is average this. So now the neural data is triggered to these button presses of seeing or not seeing the stimulus. And so what you can see is that uh, when the neural activity rises, goes up, perception seems to happen. And with a little bit of a delay, the animal says, I see it. And uh, in this case, the, when the neuron goes down, the animal says, I don't uh, see anything. So this neuron, uh, you can think of as a mind reading neuron, right? So this neuron seems to have something to do with the perception of the animal and uh, it allows us as experimenters to find out what the animal is really perceiving. Now, that is a correlate of consciousness. So what do we do with that across the brain? Well, if we look across the entire brain, so this right here would be a macaque brain, but these studies uh, have been replicated using fMRI in humans. You can step through um, the colored areas right here, which are all a part of the visual system that I just showed you about where the activity flows from the back towards the front. Here's another colleague of ours, Professor Tong and uh, Professor Randolph Blake that are still uh, with us in the Department of Psychology. And they ran several of these very important fMRI studies and they found neural correlates of consciousness. By and large, what we find is that as you move forward in the brain, you find more and more and more of these neurons. You know that I didn't put any of the numbers on here, or fractions though, in terms of how many neurons you find in which area, because the original question, whether or not we are aware of activity in the primary visual cortex is still very much debated. So despite all of these data, we do not have a clear answer yet. So uh, intriguingly, you can do these studies nowadays also in humans, and increasingly in humans. Uh, and when I say these studies, I mean taking single neurons and looking what single neurons are doing. So this is an unfortunate patient who agreed to have this photograph published. And uh, this uh, individual has very severe epilepsy, up to the point that it becomes dangerous to their health and life and others. Imagine driving a car, having a seizure, and veering off into the opposite traffic. A lot of these severe seizures cannot be treated with pharmacology. And the last resort is to do a surgery, go into the brain, try to find the tissue that's abnormal and cut it out. And so that cures the epilepsy. But you don't want to cut out too much of your brain. There goes your memory of you growing up. There goes your good morals, right? So you don't want to cut your language. You don't want to cut parts of the brain out that you need for function. You just want to cut out what is diseased. And so what can be done in these patients is to insert electrodes. You can see this here in the MRI, where uh, we have a rough idea where the seizure might originate. And then these electrodes record neural activity. This is the first surgery. And then the patients, they sit, as you can see right here, in the hospital, and they have these wires run out of their brain, literally. 
And then what we do is we deprive them of sleep because uh, sleep deprivation triggers seizures. So you wait and wait and wait until hopefully a seizure happens. And when the seizure happens, now you can see where it happens. And an ingenious move by Christoph Koch, Itzhak Fried, uh, Gabriel Kreiman, and many others at the time was to use these electrodes, slightly modify them to have wires stick out at the end, and now you can get single neurons. These patients, they sit in a the hospital, they're very bored. They're sleep deprived, they have nothing to do. So they're very happy to agree to run a quick experiment, and now we can show them these visual illusions, and we can look at what the neurons are doing. So um, let me show you a quick movie. I hope the sound works, but if not, I can. So if this works, I do not hear the sound, but that's okay. What you can see right here is the activity of the neuron. Usually we'll hear it cracking if the sound will work. And this is what the patient is seeing. These are just randomly average video clips. This was done in the 90s, so there's a lot of 90s material right here. And watch what happens. There's no activity of the single neuron. But at this point, you can already see there's a response coming up. So what is going on on the screen when this neuron gets really active? The Simpsons comes on. And you can see how this neuron gets really excited and then stops responding as the uh, movie repeats and you see uh, other famous scenes again. So this neuron right here seems to be a Simpson cartoon neuron. Or there seems to be some relationship between the person experiencing the Simpsons um, and this neuron firing. So let's try again. Science is all about replication. So same neuron, you see, again, all kinds of movie scenes, and the question is, when the Simpsons come on, does the neuron respond? Or maybe the neuron responds to something differently this time. So you can see it come up right here. That's the response um, uh, of the neuron again. So watch what happens on the screen when the neuron gets really excited. There we go. So we show the Simpsons again, the neuron gets really active. So these are things that can also be done in animal experiments, of course. Now we do something that you can only do in a human experiment. So the same, uh, the same human, same neuron. Uh, now uh, we're just not showing anything to the patient anymore. We're doing something called free recall. So we're just chatting, and we're saying, "What did you see?" And you can see what the you can um, you can uh, hear right here what the patient's saying. Something about New York. So there was sex in the city. No response right here. The patient is uh uh. What else was there? The Hollywood sign I saw. Right. So mentally, the patient sees the Hollywood sign. No activity right here. But what's going to happen right there? So here, the patient laugh and say, "The Simpsons." So it truly is a mind-reading neuron in this case, right? So you can see the close link between your conscious experience and parts of the brain is not just theory. So what do we make of this? Um, to be perfectly honest, this was, the, this was about the stand of science as it was a couple of years ago, and I would have concluded the lecture at this point. I would have gone home, felt good that I convinced you guys that we can scientifically, experimentally get at this question, and that uh, now that uh, people like I might be dreaming more of retirement, the next generation can pick up the torch, and you guys can, uh, can solve these important questions. But the truth is, we ran into a dead end. What do you do once you find that there's different parts of the brain that correlate with consciousness and other parts don't? What do you do with that? That's just correlative. It's not that interesting. You can say, well, I would manipulate it. I can run currents. And so we've done that. And then if you stimulate parts of the brain that are linked to consciousness, then you get distortions in consciousness, or you can evoke certain conscious states. Uh, we can use machine learning and artificial intelligence, and we can decode the activity of the brain. Why somebody is dreaming and trying to find out what they're dreaming? Well, people are doing that. None of that really seems to get us closer to understanding that question that I started at the start of this, of this class. How can we scientifically reduce the fact that you're conscious and how you perceive consciousness to brain activity? Correlate, correlation doesn't seem to get us there. Well, here's the good news. This was published literally just a couple of weeks ago, again in Science Magazine, and here's somebody that you're familiar with. What uh, are they talking about? Well, they're celebrating that they secured uh, $20 million from the Templeton World Foundation, a private charity foundation, um, into consciousness research. And the particular idea of this massive research program is something that's called adversarial collaboration. So I'm taking this directly off the Templeton World Foundation website. What they um, uh, got convinced to do is that there's two big theories out there that are trying to go beyond this correlative approach that I just told you and trying to get to this reducibility thing. And they're competing. And if you ask people in the field, it might be half and half or you know, different odds in terms of who likes which theory best. So one of the two, and so the idea of, of uh, putting this money together is what they call adversarial collaboration, which basically means competition. So half of the money goes to these labs, half of the money goes to those labs, and then they can propose experiments 
to each other, trying to falsify the other theory. And the idea is at the end of this research program, only one survives. A good old scientific progress uh, pr process. So what are the two theories? Well, the first one is called the Global Neuronal Workspace Theory, and it's inspired by findings such as these. So uh, proponents of the global neuronal workspace theory, they typically come more from a background of EEG, fMRI. They tend to look at the brain as a whole. And what they found out is that if you run experiments that are slightly different from what I just showed you, for example, I'm uh, showing you words, but very, very briefly, and then I'm taking them away and show something else. And I ask you, could you read it? Most of the time, if it's brief enough, you can't. So then I'm just looking at what happens if you can read them versus when you can't read them. And you see that there's not just differences in the visual system, but there's also differences all throughout the brain. It seems that the moment that you become conscious, the whole brain lights up. And so that inspired this theory of a global neuronal workspace, that something magical happens as neurons start to talk across the entire brain. And that has something to do with your consciousness. I'm not doing the, th the theory justice, but I'm giving you a, a little bit of an idea of what this theory is about. Now, uh, this theory has run into problems because people have found out that a lot of this activity that you see right there, or some people at least claim, is not related to your conscious experience, but to the very fact that you have to tell the experiment uh, whether you saw the stimulus or not. So you're preparing a response, and some of this is just motor preparation activity. So there's a lot of debate going on in terms of, do you really need activity all over the brain? And uh, there are patients that I just mentioned that don't have the back of the brain. There's also patients that don't have a front of your brain. And so people that uh, don't have a prefrontal cortex, are they still conscious? Yes or no? According to this theory, no. And the others say, look at these people, clearly they are conscious. So what's the other theory? Well, that's what I want to talk with you about for the rest of this class. The other theory is called Integrated Information Theory, or short IIT. And uh, it uh, basically came into being uh, by Giulio Tononi who um, thought about this theory for a very long time. He told me ever since his childhood, he actually has been thinking about this theory. It's a vast theory. If I would give you the whole theory today, um, we would be sitting here until the end of the evening, actually probably maybe until the end of the week. It's a big, big theory. I'm showing you that it touches on philosophy, so we'd have to talk about philosophy of mind. It's very mathematized, something I'm excited about. Obviously, it links to neuroscience, and more uh, recently, also touches on artificial intelligence. It's a big theory. So why am I excited about this theory? Well, if we think about scientific theories, we can classify them by their rigor. And so this is a diagram that I just came up with, but I'm just putting some theories on there and I'm ranking them based on what we might feel is more rigorous. So at the very least, we feel a scientific theory should make sense. It should be logically, it shouldn't contradict itself. It should be logically consistent or coherent. You might have heard about this guy called Karl Popper. Karl Popper said, no, no, no. What makes a theory scientific is that it's falsifiable. If you give me a theory and I can't falsify it, that's not science. And there are theories that we kind of, think are part of science that uh, a lot of people say are not falsifiable. We can never ever do an experiment and show this theory is wrong. So Karl Popper would say, no, any scientific theory has to be falsifiable. We ha there has to be a way that I can run an experiment and show that's why this theory is wrong. We can never prove a theory. You can never prove it because somebody else might come later and show, no, actually, because of this, you were wrong. The so you can never get to the point and prove anything in science. But what you can do is you can show that things are wrong. So Karl Popper's idea about science was that we are Wrong and wrong and wrong. We err and err and err, but less and less and less. So we get to the truth by ruling out all the falsehoods. But in order to rule out all the falsehoods, the theories have to be falsifiable. So I drew a boundary around here that I call the Popperian boundary. Then we have theories that give you predictions that allow you to falsify. There's two kinds. Qualitative, such as you need the front of the brain. Well, that's a prediction. We can test that. That's falsifiable. But Newtonian physics, Maxwellian equations, a lot of what we feel is really rigorous science does more. It provides you with a mathematical framework, it formalizes things, and it's quantitative. So you can put numbers in, you get numbers out, and it makes predictions about what numbers you should get out in your experiments. IIT is right here. It is the highest rigor that's possible. So why is this exciting? Well, I just mentioned Maxwellian equations. Well, people, for the longest time, were puzzled uh, how all of these things can come about. Your iPhones, magnets, light, radios, electric guitars. Well, it turns out there's five equations, well, actually four equations that explain all of that. And so we found those in physics, those are called Maxwellian equations, and you can use them to describe all of these phenomena. We do that all the time. This is how fMRI is possible in the first place. So a lot of people are struck by that. The first one was Galileo Galilei who realized that when it comes 
to science, very often when we feel like we're getting really close to the truth, we can describe things with mathematics. So he used this poetic language and he said, the book of nature lies in front of you as a scientist, but it's written in the language of mathematics. If you want to understand the universe and nature, it's written in math. You just have to find those equations. But it seems that's how the universe works. So uh, Galileo was the first of saying it. And, um, uh, it has ever since fascinated scientists. So I highly recommend this paper by Eugene Wigner, uh, who uh, it's entitled The Unreasonable Effectiveness of Mathematics in a Natural Scientist. It is a puzzle. It is, it is something that leads people from philosophy into theology. But what does it mean to have math for consciousness? Well, here it is. This is the integrated information theory in a nutshell. So there's a whole bunch of equations that we can use to use quantitative predictions about consciousness. Uh, this is simplified, and this is also not the latest version. But I just want to give you a flavor of how rigorous this theory really is. And what does it allow us to do? Well, it allows us to make a link between your conscious states mathematically and brain activity. So we have a mathematical theory of consciousness. We're linking brain activity to consciousness, but not with a Pearson correlation anymore. We're using mathematical laws. You know, the thing that we usually call laws of nature in physics once we have them. So how does integrated information theory do that? Well, it starts out with something that it, uh, it calls axioms. That's why I said it starts with philosophy. So integrated information theory says, I don't want to convince you of anything. What are you the most sure about? Well, this morning we kind of agreed that you are pretty sure that you right now are conscious. But you might not be sure that this is real. This could be a dream. You could be an eel living on another planet and your whole life was just a dream. You could be in the matrix. It could be a computer simulation. So your certainty, your epistemic certainty, how sure you are, what's real, what is true, what you know, it goes down. It goes downhill very quickly after your consciousness. But you, you think you're conscious. So if we agree on that, then we can say, I think I'm conscious. What else can we infer from it? Well, we can infer that it's informative. There's information that you have right now. We say, well, what does it mean informative? Well, there's no blue elephant right now that we see. There's also no pink unicorn. So the fact that there are certain things we can rule out, they're not in your consciousness right now, by simple information theory means that it's informative value by ruling other things out. And I'm not going to go through all of these, but there's basically more and more of these axioms, five in total at this point, that most of us would probably agree upon and say, yes, that's exactly what I feel I am experiencing. That's what it's like to be conscious. And I'm pretty certain of that. More certain than of your Maxwellian equations. And if that is the case, then we can formalize these things mathematically. And that's the math that I just showed you. So we have five axioms, and it gets translated into this math. There's a gist to it, though, and I just want to give you the gist. So the gist is that your consciousness has information, as I just said. It is integrated, as I just said. And it is composed, it's intrinsic, and it's ex uh, exclusive in terms of what you experience. You're, for example, unaware, you can't have any conscious experience, visual context experience of what's behind your back right now. It's limited, it's exclusive. So I'll give you an idea of what this means in theory. So if you think of a simple photodiode, for example, it's also possible uh, for a photodiode, uh, photodiode um, to see light. So a photodiode goes on or off, depending whether it gets hit by photons or not. And if we take a digital camera, it's basically a million or more, at this point, 15 million or more photodiodes. So you can take an image with a digital camera and it looks pretty close to what you perceptually experience. But we don't think that a photo camera is conscious. And the idea is that a photo camera does not integrate. It has information, but it's not integrated. So what do we mean by that? So if we look at the back of a photo camera, you see each of these individual pixels, they're all diodes. They go on and off depending on how much light they get. So if we show uh, a beautiful painting to a digital camera, it can sense that and turn it into information. And then we can take that information to a computer, we can print it out, and it looks like that image to us. But the important thing is it's not integrated. So if you cut, literally physically mutilate or severe these photodiodes so that there's no crosstalk happening, this still works. The photo camera will still work. There's no integration. There's no crosstalk among, among these photodiodes. Well, that's not true for humans. So in humans, as you might uh, have learned in other courses, there's two hemispheres, and there seems to be integration happening between these hemispheres. How do we know that? Well, if a human looks at the very same scene, keeps their eyes straight right there, and then we cut in humans, the left from the right hemisphere, this doesn't work anymore. So if you now uh, ask these humans, they're called split brain patients. It's a procedure that was done in the old days to treat uh, severe epilepsy. So you cut all connections between the left and right hemisphere of the brain, and then you give them a pen in the left and right hand, and they're supposed to draw what they're seeing. You see that 
the left hand is drawing what the right hand of the brain sees. Why is that? Because there's this crossover between the right brain and your left hand and vice versa. But the interesting thing is that the other hand draws what's on the other side. So it's like each hemisphere is seeing something independently of each other, and they only have access to that. So oh, each hand draws half of the picture, but there's no more crossover. And in fact, if you ask those patients, why did you draw this? Then you're talking to the left side of their brain where language is, and you're showing them what the right side of the brain was drawing. They say, I have no idea. I don't know why my hand did this. So it looks like if you cut the two hemispheres apart in humans, you end up with two consciousness, one in the left side and one in the right side. We can be pretty sure about the one in the left side. I'm simplifying, there's a lot of debate about this as well, but you can see, you can get a hunch for what I mean by integrated information. Information by itself is not conscious, but if you integrate it, something seems to happen, and in fact the theory says it's not happening, your consciousness is integrated information. There's an identity relationship right there. So what does the math do? Well, the math does something very simple. The math says that whenever you have information flow and there is crosstalk, there's integration, that's, info, that's consciousness. So here we have a very simple system. This could be logic gates. This could be on a CPU. This could be neurons. So there's like four neurons. And you see that these neurons, the X1 neuron talks to Y1 neuron and Y2 neuron. And then there's also this crosstalk. So the system is integrated, okay? Very simple. And so when this neuron fires, it can activate this neuron, this neuron, this neuron fires, it can activate this neuron, this neuron. There's a little bit of crosstalk, there's information. Very, very simple. So what we can do mathematically is mutilate the system the same way I just did with the photodiode and with the hemispheres. So I can make a cut and just cut some of these connections. I could physically go in the brain and cut those axons, but beautifully, I can also do this if I have a full mathematical description of the system, which just means I have to record the activity of these neurons at the same time, do it for long enough. I can do that analytically. I can run a computer algorithm that does that for us. We have the calculus developed to do these kinds of calculations. And then the theory does something very simple. It says, is there a difference in the function of the system, if I look at the whole statistics, the system as a whole, between here and here? If I find a difference, I should not have done that. I should have not mutilated it. This right here had effective power. These were non-reducible, effective, important connections. They mattered. There was integration. So, I can quantify how much is that difference between this and that, and it gives me a number. Or I find the number is zero. So I mutilated these connections, I look at the system, after I make this uh, intervention, there's no difference. That meant these connections have no causal power, they're ineffective, they're not really important. <clears throat> now integrated information theory does that for entire systems. Nowadays we, we can record dozens, hundreds of neurons at the same time, and it provides you to math to go all through all these possible effective connections that you can see in your data, it tests them analytically. Are they making a difference if I mutilate them, yes or no? And then quantifies that. So it's a lot of computer code. If you are interested, I went through the trouble of putting it on a Google Collab, which is basically a website where you can run code. So I've written in Python and it comes with commentary. So you can upload some of your own data if you're interested and see if there's consciousness. Now people have been doing that and I've taken some shortcuts here. Um, these are uh, not exactly studies using that very technique, but they're using similar techniques and have been testing whether the theory holds yes or no. So what you can see right here is data from different anesthetics. You can see uh, midazolam, pr propofol, different anesthetics, and you can see um, if I make a, a distinction in the system, if I cut these connections, if you will, is there a big difference, yes or no, and you see there's not a big difference. So there's no consciousness. But in wakefulness, when the same people are uh, 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 conscious, you see these values go up, exactly as the theory predicts. There seems to be more integration. The interesting part is that during dreaming and ketamine, which is a, it's a very interesting uh, anesthetic uh, that makes you look like you're anesthetized, and in fact, you are not experiencing pain or the world anymore, but it puts you in a dreamlike state. It's actually kind of like a psychedelic. You can see the values are pretty high. So now we went from what I told you at the very beginning of this class, that we can't look into a brain and find out whether this uh, a person is conscious or not, to mathematically, quantitatively, finding out whether there's conscious experience going on. That is why this theory is exciting. And more has been done. People have looked at, uh, just to give you different ideas, that this is not uh, just a pipe dream. People are testing this and testing this and testing this. Uh, I'm not explaining, all, I'm not gonna explain all of these data. People have looked doing sleep, dream sleep, uh, lucid uh, dreaming. Uh, all of these uh, studies uh, that were published, uh, there's dozens of them at this point, they all test the theory. And so 
far, none of them has falsified the theory. So far, the theory has always um, have proven things right. Well, here's the most apart, uh, amazing part about this theory. Remember that in the beginning of this class, and this is just the last two slides, in the beginning of this class, I told you that there's a difference between the contents of your consciousness and the level of your consciousness. What I told you, if you pay close attention, is that the theory tells you about the level. It tells you how much consciousness there is, anesthesia, no anesthesia. Well, the theory does more, and this is where the theory gets really interesting. The theory is saying that if I look at the whole system and I describe it in this structure, in this cause-effect structure that I said, where you look at every possible interaction in the system and you're testing it, do I need this, yes or no, and you're getting the effective interactivity, if you put this in a multidimensional space, that is not just uh, the basis of deriving this one number to see the level, that is your conscious experience, that is right there the content of your consciousness. That is where for a lot of people the theory is going way too far, but that's where the most interesting developments are happening. So take this uh, with this diagram again, where we have the contents of consciousness and the levels of consciousness. And I said, this is the most interesting state, where you are awake, as you might still are a little bit, more drowsy than before, but I can fix that. And you look at a visual illusion like that, you saw, and it's like, read it fast, a bird in the bush. It's like, no, 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 read it again. A bird in the, the bush. So the first time that you saw that, you probably didn't see the second the, something called repetition blindness. So that means that with the same stimulus, you had two different consciousness states, two different contents of consciousness. In one, it looked like this, a bird in the bush, and then your second consciousness state was a bird in the, the bush. Now you see that extra the. So the idea of integrated information theory is that we can get you one number, which is the level of consciousness that you are in. It might, be, might have been really high at the beginning of this class and dipped a little slightly towards the end. We call that phi. That's the one, one number. It literally is just a fractional scalar. That's your phi. But more interestingly, we can also, along this dimension, look at the difference of the cause-effect structure inside your brain, and that would allow us to see that difference of the two perceptual conscious experiences that you had. Can we get at that? Well, of course, if you would have to do it for your consciousness right now, we would probably have to measure all the neurons simultaneously in the entire brain, maybe not even the neurons. Maybe every single synapse is what's part of the system of cause and effect. So we cannot do this right now. But if you ask me, my personal opinion, we're talking about technical limitations, and those are boring. If there's one thing that has happened to mankind is that we've always pushed, pushed past technical limitations. When they built the Space Mountain at Disneyland in the 1960s, they wanted to have four trains go around to deal with a high number of people. When they built that, they realized we can't because computers cannot do the computations to run those trains. They looked at the development of computers over time. They saw it's an exponential increase. They went to Walt Disney and said, in five years, computers can do it. That's what happened. That's why we have Space Mountain. Technical limitations are boring. We can get at those. So, there might be a point where we can get all of the activity of your brains. What I want to, con uh, to convince you of is that we've solved the harder problem, the theoretical side, or at least there might be a way to get at that. So what can we do? Well, we can measure these things right now in simpler systems. So what I'm showing you right here is a study that was just published a couple of months ago by a colleague and friend of mine, now it's a key in his lab. And what he did, you can see right here, is quantify phi between anesthesia and non-anesthesia. What he's measuring right here is a fruit fly. So you take a tiny fruit fly, and you know that they have something called a mushroom body that looks kind of like a CNS or brain. They put in multiple electrodes, they measure these electrodes, uh, these neurons, and then they do these computations with the math that I just told you, and lo and behold, the theory does the right prediction again. So they tried to falsify the theory, the theory did not budge. It doesn't, uh, it doesn't get falsified. Phi goes down with anesthesia. But this is the part that's more interesting to me. Now they're trying to compute the cause-effect structure. So what they're doing right here is trying to come up with a multi-dimensional space that then gets broken down, in this case, to a three-dimensional space that we can visualize, and they can see these differences in what might be the uh, experience, uh, in this case, of the fruit fly. Excitingly, what they did a couple of months ago is already outdated. So the, uh, the way that they try to get at that isn't exactly the way that the theory predicts. The math, the Python code is actually all available now as a beta version on um, the GitHub of uh, the, the lab of Giulia Tononi, and I put it in the Python um, website if you're interested. So we have uh, even an improvement over this. So I hope that in this very long lecture, I was able to take you on a journey and to convince you 
that what you going in might have also thought is infeasible, impossible, a pipe dream or something that should be done in a very long future, which is that we look at brain activity and we try to derive conscious states, not just how much, but even also what a person consciously experiences uh, is in your grasp. In fact, it's just a click on a website away. And with that, thank you very much, everyone. We have a little bit of time for questions.